17 minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this Friday morning. Got a good book to share with you, and I think it's a it's a it's a debut book for our guest. Uh, the book is. The, thir- the 53rd Parallel, Carl Nordgren has done a wonderful job. If I'm not mistaken, it's his first book. Um, there, there, there's a big thing happening in uh, in Disney, I think, with the an Irish Festival tonight or something. Tomorrow? Uh, this weekend, starting just, Saturday, going through Monday. Just something I thought I'd bring up. <laughs> <laughs> something about the book reminded me of that. Uh, Carl Nordgren is uh, a fishing guide, it says here. He's an entrepreneur and he's a professor of creativity at Duke University. And his novel is called The 53rd Parallel, A River of Lakes Novel. Let's find out about it from Carl. Good morning, Carl. Good morning, Larry. Good morning, Robin. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. So what was the what was the Irish part of this that I was trying to remember? <laughs> well, it, the, 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 the story is, is set in two worlds. Um, the, the working title, in fact, for the novel until right before it was published was Dreams of Irish and Indians. Oh, wow. Uh, and I was just so fascinated about how uh, many commonalities I found in the worlds that I got to live in. I got to live with these Ojibwe Indians in northwest Ontario back in the 60s. We got to spend some time, my family did, in Ireland, in the west of Ireland, 12 years or so ago. And the, and the era that I, where the novel begins, which is before World War II, um, there was just so many commonalities between the lives that these people were living, and so I just found that as uh, an interesting, and I hope the readers would find it as an interesting a setup for this historical novel that uh, that tells this important story about what's happened to these Aboriginal people in Canada. So, so you, you've written a novel, but it really has some historical observations. It does. It has a couple of uh, significant ones. It's at the heart of uh, of, of of it all. Uh, it, it is the beginning of a trilogy, and this trilogy will tell the story, the true story of a terrible environmental catastrophe that has happened to the Ojibwe Indians and that to this day continues to devastate their lives. And my hope is that by getting these novels out and telling their story that perhaps some justice will occur. Um, and, and so they are the, the Ojibwe. I, I, in the 60s, I had the good fortune of working as a fishing guide at a fly-in fishing camp, a most extraordinary fishing camp, a place where people like John Wayne and Natalie Wood and and uh, um, James Hoffa uh, used to go as guests uh, really? a, fly, a, fly, a fly-in camp. Um, and I was just, I just fell in love with this place. And my great fortune added to that good fortune was the fact that I was adopted. Uh, the minute I stepped off the plane, the very first day I arrived, I was adopted by an off-the-reserve clan of Ojibwe Indians, a, 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 an extended family clan yeah. that still was living very much the life on the river that their ancestors had lived. And so besides helping me become a proficient fishing guide, this family of Ojibwe Indians also introduced me to their ancient ways. And so I had the wonderful benefit of... Oh, wow. You know, uh, uh, I kind of wish we had more time to talk to you. So, you know, but your obse- observation about the Ojibwe Indians is probably the same for all of the Native Americans. I'm, I'm guessing it's a truth across the board. Well, there certainly are many commonalities, and the fact that I got to live in the modern era with with a with a clan of Indians who were still trying to live in the ancient ways uh, gave me the opportunity to have that insight into some of the basic Aboriginal practices. Um, and I do try to explore those in this book and try to give people a, a behind-the-scenes yeah. view. And, and so, so the major historical event that's, that informs all of this, again, is this lar- the, the worst mercury poisoning event in North American history occurred to these people, and nobody knows about it, and they continue to suffer from it. And so my hope is that by telling a big, adventurous, sprawling story with this as the reveal, uh, that perhaps I can shine some light uh, on what's happened to this Okay, people. okay. So, and, and the mercury, you say it's still happening? And why, what, what caused it? Was it uh, something we did as humans? Was it something natural that occurred? It was, it was uh, just a classic unintended consequence. Uh, back in the late 1950s, a, a paper mill, a pulp company that owned a paper mill, uh, decided it was time to innovate and to create a, a, the new, harder, shinier paper that all this office automation was going to require. And the first process that anybody came up with to create that new, hard, shiny paper that could slip you know, gracefully, quickly through a Xerox machine was a mercury-based process. 
And Larry, the environmental ignorance being what it was in the late 50s, the Ontario provincial government actually permitted the Dryden Pulp and Paper Company to dump the mercury effluent right into the river. We're oh, talking about the my goodness. Yeah, we're talking about the English River, which is a north flowing river up towards Hudson Bay. And it took 20 years or so before the contaminant flowed as far north as we were. But when it did, it just totally devastated the population of Ojibwe. And here's, the, here's what compounds the catastrophe, and that is in the 1880s, when the Aboriginal people of Canada were signing their peace treaties with the Canadian government, they signed away their rights to sue the Canadian government. Well, this pulp company, this paper company, is a crown corporation, a category of corporation that exists in Canada. And as a crown corporation, they had all the same rights and protections of their federal government. So the Ojibwe people, who were the victims of 30,000 tons of mercury being dumped into the river, had no legal recourse. Um, and so to this, and, and for a couple of years, both the government and the and business was just declaring that these extraordinary health problems that were beginning to, beginning to occur had nothing to do with the fact <laughs> that they that they were eating fish laced with mercury. Oh wow! So this is very intricate, more more than I realized. And uh, you you also have the characters in the book Marine in particular. That uh, there's a another story going on there outside of the Ojibwe Indians. So you have all of these different stories intertwining, uh, especially since she's got the IRA in her past. That's right. Maureen is a lovely woman. I'm just, I just fell in love with Maureen. I've had so much fun getting to know her over the course of these novels that I'm writing. And Maureen, as an as a 18, 19-year-old young woman, does indeed become involved with the IRA out of revenge for the fact that her father uh, is killed in a ra rather brutal fashion by the British. Um, and so she participates in another historical event that very few people know about, and that is that during World War II, the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, and the Nazis tried to collaborate. Um, the idea, the IRA motivation was, you know, the old enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so their hope was that if the British saw that the IRA were prepared to fight with the Nazis, that maybe the British would be more inclined to come to the negotiating table and the Irish could finally win independence. Uh, and so Maureen becomes a very key character in this historical event of the IRA and the Nazis working together. And, and the outcome of her efforts really puts the, the creation of this fishing camp in Canada in motion because, in fact, she uses stolen IRA Nazi money to build the fishing camp. So this gorgeous, beautiful, heaven-on-earth Eden that's being created by these Irish people and the Ojibwe that they find is all, it, from the beginning, uh, is, it has got this uh, curse in the fact that it's been built with IRA, uh, with IRA money. Wow. Um, you, you've got us definitely wanting to read the book. I don't need to ask for a movie trailer version. You've done it already. Uh, you've done better than that. Uh, the book is called The 53rd Parallel. Um, I have a copy of it. I'd like to give it away. Carl Nordgren is the author. And uh, if you call me right now, I'll put your name on it and leave it for you here at the station. Carl, do you want to give us information on how we can go by it? Do you have a website? I do have a website. My last name is a little tricky to spell. It's Nordgren, N-O-R-D-G-R-E-N. -E and so my website is carlnordgren.com. The book, of course, is available uh, as, uh, as everything is available on right. Amazon. Right, right. And what they'll also find on the website, Larry, is, is there's a PDF there with the first three chapters of the novel. So if people are intrigued, uh, they can sample the first three chapters. My challenge to folks, the first chapter is only a page and a half long. And my challenge to folks is that if they were to read that opening uh, chapter a page and a half long, I have a high level of confidence that I'll have them hooked and that they'll really enjoy <laughs> how, the story, how the story begins to reveal itself. <laughs> Do you know, on, on the parallel that we're at, and I don't know what the number is, but around the world, every place is pretty much a, a desert. But Florida is the exception to the rule, whereas in your, I mean, your observation is that there's a lot of similarities along the parallel. Of course, that might not include Asia, but uh, it, it's just interesting how that works. Yeah, by the way, real quick observation I've made, Irish music sounds a lot like Western, like the, like the old country music. Yes. <laughs> not the new yes, stuff. Yes. Not the new stuff, but... Not the new stuff. Well, there's a lot of times where there's Irish... It's interesting that you would bring up music because there's many times... I, well, I was last week, I was up at the Ojibwe Museum of... Uh, museum, uh, excuse me, the Museum of Ojibwe Culture up at the 
up at um, the, the Straits of Mackinac, uh, where an elder taught me how to make a drum, a, a Ojibwe drum. And oh, I wow. was making the drum, I was thinking, well, this is exactly the same drum as the Irish use. That is cool. That is cool. So there's a lot of parallels, a lot of parallels between the two cultures. And I like the word parallel. The 53rd parallel is the book Carl Nordgren is the author. Thank you so much, Carl. Great interview. We'll, well be Robin and Larry, thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. News Radio. I'm Chris Foster. The terror threat level is raised in England because of possible attacks being planned by militants in Syria and Iraq. This is not some foreign conflict thousands of miles from home that we can hope to ignore. British Prime Minister David Cameron